So I invite you to turn in your Bibles today to the book of Joel in the Old Testament, chapter 2. We'll be reading verses 12 through 17. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. There you'll find it in your Bible. If you're using the Pew Bible on the rack in front of you, you'll find it on page 761. Here's the context for the passage. God has visited upon his people, the Jewish nation, a devastating plague of locusts. And when I say devastating, I mean devastating. The insects had stripped all the grain fields bare, had stripped even the grape vineyards bare. The people of Israel were in perilous condition. And into that context with God visiting serious judgment upon his people, he in his mercy sends his prophet, his spokesman, Joel, mainly with one word, repent. And in this section of our text today, we'll hear the Lord calling not just Israel of old to repentance then, but you and me, the people of God, to repentance today. Joel 2, verses 12 through 17. Hear the word of the Lord. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, Consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? May God add his blessing to this reading from his holy and inspired word. In the last 30 months, undoubtedly, across your mind at some point has come this question. What is God saying to the human race through the COVID-19 pandemic? Or more specifically, what is God saying to the church through the COVID-19 pandemic, or even more specifically, what is God saying to me through the COVID-19 pandemic? Now, undoubtedly, because there are billions of people in the world, there are billions of messages that God is speaking through the pandemic. But by the grace of God, through his word in the passage we just read, and other passages like it, like Luke 13, verses 1 through 5, 
And Amos 4, verses 6 through 11, the one word that we can be certain that God is speaking, no, let me correct that, that God is shouting to all people everywhere, but especially to his church through the COVID-19 pandemic is this word, repent, repent. And I use the verb shouting, of course, deliberately, because many of you remember that C.S. Lewis in his book, The Problem of Pain, wrote so famously, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our consciences, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. I want to suggest to you on the authority of the Word of God that for the past 30 months, God, through his divine megaphone, has been shouting to the world in general and to the church in particular the message, repent. But have we heard his voice? Now this morning, I need to be especially careful and especially pastorally sensitive because I am well aware that there are those of you in the congregation this morning and watching online who have lost people you love, friends, family, in the COVID-19 pandemic. I lost two good Christian friends in the pandemic. Further, I know that there are some in a congregation this size this morning who still suffer the physical effects of having been through COVID-19 yourself. Therefore, I ask you to hear me very carefully and very compassionately by the grace of God this morning. Do not hear me saying through this passage, please do not hear me saying, that COVID-19 was God's judgment on your loved one or on you yourself or even on the world because Jesus Christ, in John 9, verses 1 through 3, and in fact, the entire book of Job, warned me against such presumption. When we see calamity, the Bible says, unless we're a prophet of the Lord, we're not to rush to pronounce it judgment on any person or any group of people. Instead, what we're to hear through that calamity, and this is the case in every calamity, whether the judgment of God or not the judgment of God. Whenever we see calamity, the Bible teaches us what we're to hear God in his mercy shouting to us through that calamity is one word, repent, repent. I'm not a prophet of the Lord as Joel was because he was a prophet of the Lord. He could connect the locust plague with God's judgment. I'm neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet. I'm not entitled to do that with COVID-19, but what I am entitled to do only on the authority of God's word is to tell you that God is shouting to us, shouting to his church, shouting to all humanity through COVID-19, repent, repent. And so we want to take this passage, 
because Joel here explains as clearly as anywhere else in Scripture what repentance involves. So if you have your bulletin this morning and you have the sermon outline, you'll see that point number one has to do with the nature of repentance. I'm going to suggest to you in the next few minutes four truths concerning the nature of repentance. Truth number one, repentance involves a turning from and a returning to. Repentance involves a turning from sin and a returning to God. Look at verses 12 through 13 of the passage again. Yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. Look at the middle of verse 13. Return to the Lord your God. If you drop down to verse 14 and you see the verb turn, it's the same verb. There are two main Hebrew verbs that describe the act of repentance. This is one of them. And this particular verb describes repentance as a turning from sin and a, turn, a returning to God. Maybe this illustration will help. Let's suppose that you were on a trip to Milwaukee but you set out on the interstate going south from here toward Indianapolis instead. At some point, you would realize you were wrong and you would turn around by going off an exit and you would return northward toward Milwaukee. That's not a perfect picture, but it's something of a picture of repentance, especially as Joel describes it here. It is a turning, it is fundamentally a turning from sin and a returning to God. That's what God is shouting. Turn from your sins and return to me. Truth number two concerning the nature of repentance, we can only repent by the grace of God. I do not have the strength or the will in and of myself to turn from my sins and to return to the Lord. God must grant me the grace to do that. I must pray, God, grant me the grace, the ability, the power, the willingness to turn from my sins and to turn to you. Truth number three about the nature of repentance, it involves the whole person. And by the whole person, I mean it involves our minds, our intellects, our emotions, our hearts, and it involves our wills. For example, to repent involves in our minds agreeing with God that our sin is, in fact, the sin that he calls it to be. Several years ago, you may remember the story some members of a social fraternity at Oklahoma University decided to post racially offensive videos on social media. To, the, to its credit, the university shut down that social fraternity almost immediately. But what troubled me almost as much as the videos themselves was the response of one of the members of that social fraternity who said in an interview I listened to on the radio, we made a big mistake. No, a mistake is saying two plus two equals five. There's no moral culpability in that. You sinned. You sinned against the law of God written in his word. You sinned against the law of God he has written on the human heart, Romans chapter 2, verses 15 to 16. You sinned ultimately against God himself, God who is holy 
holy, holy. Repentance says simply, God, I will not excuse my sin. It is what you call it to be. And I agree in my mind with you is my sin that your word says my sin in fact is. Second, true repentance involves the emotions. It involves the heart. Look at the warning of uh, the prophet Joel at the end of chapter of verse 12 and the beginning of verse 13. He writes, return to the Lord with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, with sadness over your sin. Sadness that your sin has offended a holy God. When we sin, we often offend other people. And yes, we need to make things right with the people against whom we sin. We need to ask their forgiveness. But all sin of all kinds is ultimately against a God who is holy, holy, holy. And there should be a sadness that God, I've uh, offended your holiness. And look what, how Joel continues at the beginning of verse 13. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Jews in Joel's day would tear their clothes as an outward sign of their mourning over sin. But God knew that the tearing of clothes could be merely outward. Like the child who tells his mom or dad, I'm sorry for what I did, not because he's really sorry, but because he doesn't want to suffer the consequences of what he's done. We can be that way. We can say, God, I'm sorry, and we don't feel it in our hearts. If you want to see the, maybe the best biblical example of somebody who really felt sorrow over his terrible sin, it's David in Psalm 51 where he cried out against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgments. True repentance involves the intellect, it involves the emotions, and then third and finally, of course it involves the will. There is a real turning from sin. If I suffer with the sin of pride, I resolve with God's help to strive to turn from the sin of pride. If I struggle with the sin of lust, I resolve with God's help to turn from the sin of lust. If I struggle with the sin of selfishness, I resolve with God's help to turn from the sin of selfishness. True repentance involves the whole person. Fourth and finally, the fourth and final truth under point number one, and some of you have anticipated this point. The prophet Joel, when he spoke these words to Israel, was speaking to a mixed nation. Some Israelites were trusting in the Lord for their salvation. Many were not trusting in the Lord for their salvation. And so when he called them to repent, the repentance of the unbeliever is different from the repentance of the believer. The repentance of the unbeliever is what Acts 11:18 calls the repentance that leads to life. It is the once for all times turning from sin and turning to God to trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation why? Because Jesus lived the life without sin we cannot live. Because Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for the sins of sinners. And because he rose from the dead on the third day after death and is alive to bring salvation to all sinners who will simply receive the grace of God, to trust in him alone apart from their good works, to save them from sin and to give them eternal life. Some of you today need to pray, God, pour down the grace that I may repent unto life. 
trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation. But my guess is many more of you to here this morning are even now hanging on to Jesus for dear life to save you from sin and to give you eternal life. And for you, the repentance is the repentance of every, that should be, every day Christian life. Every day turning from sins, returning to the Lord. I'm not, and Joel's not, the only one in church history who's called God's people to repentance. Martin Luther, his 95 theses, what was the very first one that launched the Protestant Reformation in 1517? Here it is, and I quote, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he will the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. God has willed that the entire life of believers would involve a turning from sin and a returning to God. The Gospel of Matthew, the first words of John the Baptist recorded in the Gospel of Matthew are, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The first words of Jesus Christ, the first public words, of Jesus Christ recorded in the Gospel of Matthew are, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The people of God before anybody else on earth. God is shouting to us through COVID-19, through his word, repent, turn from your sins and return to me. I love these words of Ray Ortland when he writes on this passage in Joel 2, he writes, maybe we the church aren't really the victims we think we are. Maybe we're a part of the problem. And maybe we would be wise to respond to the distress of our historical situation with less defensiveness and more repentance. One reason we see so little repentance in the world is that the world sees so little repentance in the church. Now, points two through five in your sermon outline in your bulletin this morning, we're going to look together briefly from Joel 2 at four what I will call aspects of repentance described in these verses. Aspect number one, verse 13, the incentive for repentance. The incentive, what's God's incentive for us to repent? Well, look at the middle of the verse. Return to the Lord your God. Why? The little word for. Here's our reason, right? For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And he relents over disaster. Now, where did Joel get the idea that God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and that he relents over disaster? Where did Job get that idea? From the Bible, right? Exodus 34, verses six through seven, where when God revealed himself to Moses, he said, the Lord, the Lord, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. These are God's own words. God has described his character. Maybe the best picture of verse 13 is in Jesus' parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15. You remember, the younger son has squandered his half of his father's fortune on riotous living. But in a foreign land, he has come to his senses. He has come to repentance. Repentance. 
And he says, I will return to the house of my father because surely my father at the very least will allow me to be a servant in his household. And the son begins to journey back home to his father. And you know the story. The father sees him a long way off. And the father runs to embrace the son and declares to his servants, kill the fatted calf. For my son who was lost has been found. My son who was gone has returned. What's the incentive for repentance? That the God to whom we return abounds in steadfast love and faithfulness. His first word is not judgment, brothers and sisters. God's first word is grace. Grace and steadfast love are more fundamental in this sense to the character of God, even than his righteousness as important and as in integral to his person as the righteousness of God is. So when we repent, we turn from our sins and return to God with the expectation that he will flood us with his forgiveness and his steadfast love. But be careful, we do not do so presumptively. Look at the very next words, the beginning of verse 14. Who knows? whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. God is a sovereign God. He promises that when we repent, when we turn from sin and return to him, he will forgive our sins. He promises he will bless us for repentance. But he is the one who, Ephesians 1.11, works all things according to the counsel of his will. And therefore, the nature of the blessing is in his hands. He simply calls us to repentance. If we repent thinking, well, if I repent, surely God will lift the COVID-19 pandemic, or if I repent, surely God will restore the American economy. That's presumption. We simply obey. And we know that God will forgive and that he will bless, but the nature of the blessing is in his sovereign hands. I know that some of you are really sharp and some of you are already thinking, gosh, Joel chapter two, sounds a lot like one of my favorite verses in the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles 7.14, which God spoke to Solomon at the time of the dedication of the temple in Jerusalem. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from my wicked ways, what's that called? Repentance, thank you then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. If by God's grace we repent and it is heartfelt, if by God's grace we turn from sin and return to him, he promises he will heal our land. But we cannot be presumptuous, verse 14 warns it's against it. The nature of that healing is in God's hands. God will always forgive our sins. He will always bless repentance. But the nature of the blessing is in his infinitely wise, infinitely loving hands, the hands of the God, of the God who works all things according to the, uh, for the good of those who are called according to his purposes, those who love him. The third aspect of repentance that we see in these verses is the, uh, the urgency of that repentance, the urgency of that. We see it in two places. Look at verse 12. 
Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. Now, now is the time for repentance. God has been shouting to us for 30 minutes as a church in the United States of America. Now's the time to heed his voice and to turn from our sins and return to him. But then it gets even stronger beginning in verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the congregation. Assemble the elders. Here meaning the older people. Gather the children. Even nursing infants. When God's people come together to repent, moms with nursing infants and those nursing infants are to be a part of it. But listen to the next one. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. A couple has been married, but they have not yet consummated the marriage. And God says the matter of repentance is so urgent that the bride and the bridegroom must leave their chambers even before the consummation of the marriage to come and join the rest of God's people in repentance before him. The situation is just that urgent. And so we might query, ask a question of the prophet Joel. Why exactly, Joel, is the situation as urgent as you say? And this is our fourth and final aspect of repentance, which is the reason for it, which we see in the last verse, verse 17. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. And then here's the key phrase. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? It should astonish us, brothers and sisters, that the God who created the universe simply by speaking it into being, has staked the most valuable thing in the universe, namely his glory, in large measure on the spiritual health of the church. Do you see what verse 17 is saying? Because Israel, the Jewish nation, had become so spiritually weak, so spiritually weak that God was judging it by a locust plague. Because of that spiritual weakness, the nations around Israel were saying, well, where is their God? If they're so spiritually weak that they're enduring calamity like this, their God must not be very impressive. And so that world that's outside the four walls of this church and every other church in this country, that world looks as us, at us, the, the church in the United States. Does it by and large see a spiritually vital, spiritually vibrant people? Or does it see a church that in all candor, and it's my life too, is still too full of sin and needs to repent that God might revive her? Does it vex your soul to know that God is dishonored by the spiritual weakness of the church. That God is dishonored by my spiritual weakness. 
you might ask, is there one sin that you believe to be characteristic of the church in the United States? I do. I believe it's a sin that I'll call God neglect. 30 years ago in a book called God in the Wasteland, the theologian David Wells wrote this sentence. It still rings in my ears. God now rests too inconsequentially upon the church. God now rests too inconsequentially upon the church, meaning God is not a big enough deal in my life, and God is not a big enough deal in the life of the church. This is what God neglect looks like, at least in my life. It means walking through my day caring more that my will would be done than that God's will would be done. It looks like caring more about my glory than about the glory of God. It looks like caring about my sin in the negative sense, committing sin, than about the righteousness of God. I am guilty of God neglect. God is far too often not the blazing center that he should be of all the affections of my soul. So what is God calling me to do? What is God calling you to do? What is God calling the church to do? One word. He's shouting to us through COVID, repent. Whether COVID is judgment or not judgment, what is he shouting? Repent, repent. How might you and I respond? Respond as the Lord leads you. I don't know. It may be that at the end of the service when we have sung and said amen, you should stay in your seat for a while and do business with God. Maybe come down to these steps and make it an altar. One thing I've resolved to do in my heart is to set aside a day this week for fasting and for focusing on prayers of repentance. I'll be asking the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, to put his finger on sin in my heart, and as he does, I'll be asking God for the grace to turn from that sin and return to God. But let me ask two things as we close this morning. Number one, please, I beseech you, Please do not allow your soul to ignore what God is shouting through Joel 2, 12, 17. Please do not let your soul be easy and at rest, not hearing God's call to repentance. Do not say, well, my sins aren't so bad. My late father used to love to tell a story on himself of a time in his Christian life when he was really satisfied with where he was in his life because there, was n there were no major sins, at least as he perceived it. And one morning when he was on his way to work, God the Holy Spirit put his finger so directly on my father's heart about, quote, little sins in his life that my dad, a man's man, had to pull off to the side of the road and wept for a long time as he repented from his sins. And then finally, it would not be right if I did not leave you with God's word of mercy. When God calls, 
his people to repentance. It is always a merciful call. Why? Why is it always merciful? Always, always. Because we are turning from sin, which is self-destructive. And God is calling us to return to himself to the God of whom David said, in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Hear the mercy of God. Repent. Let's pray. God, it is wonderful that Paul wrote in Philippians 2.13, that when you give us a command, you give us the grace both to desire to obey that command and then the power to obey that command as well. And so God, you very clearly through Joel 2.12 through 17 have called us to repentance. Grant, Lord, grant us the grace both to will it and to do it. And then, Father, just one last word as we were singing. The thought came to my mind, wouldn't it be great, Lord, if you began a revival in this city and in this nation, in the good, old, venerable, moody church. Grant it, Lord, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.